Coming up next on Conversations, author and screenwriter Delia Efron. This is what you were destined to do? Yes, my parents were screenwriters, and we were really raised to be writers. I, I don't think they were interested in anything else, and if we wanted attention, we had to say something funny, or my father would say at the dinner table, that's a great line, write it down, or that's a great title. How a mean boss, a failed marriage, and a book about crocheting launched Delia Efron's writing career. If you're a writer, all the worst things that happen to you become your story. Her success as a screenwriter, as she and older sister Nora Efron collaborated on hit movies and plays. I write books because no one can touch them. They're my voice, it's where I am at the time, but a movie has a kind of excitement yeah. that is undeniable. And how her new novel, The Lion Is In, was inspired by an anxiety attack and a powerful dream. It was a, an imperative. <laughs> I, I literally got up and started writing. Delia Efron, next on Conversations. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you. Delia Efron, welcome to Conversation. So good to have you here in Seattle. I'm excited to be here. I haven't been here since since Sleepless. So oh, really? I've been here a couple times since Sleepless. Wow, that's, that's been a while. I know, I know. Sleepless. I love Seattle. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel very honored because uh, I, I have been able to talk now with the number two Efron sister. Two yes. of what? Uh, four. Four. Yeah, you have two more to go. Oh, well, they better come to town too. and write a book. Yes. That runs <laughs> they in the have. family, They've right? all written books. Yeah, yes, yeah. it does run in the family. Um, Nora was a lot of fun and uh, very humorous. Are you guys all just cut-ups? No, we're not really? all cut-ups. Really? Well, you know how in families everybody gets labeled? Yeah. Uh, Nora was labeled the smart one and I was labeled the funny one. <laughs> and But, you know, in families that... That's just your parents' mixed up point of view because Nora's really funny and I'm not as good in math as she is. So, you know, <laughs> she may be smarter too. But you guys have but teamed together. Not in English. Oh, really? <laughs> you get her in English? Just, no, but, but she doesn't best me in it. Writing in your family. I mean, this is what you were destined to do? Yes, my parents were screenwriters and we were really raised to be writers. I, I don't think they were interested in anything else and if we wanted attention we had to say something funny or my father would say at the dinner table that's a great line write it down or that's a great title and we were just uh, just totally I, I think there wasn't even another issue there was there were no other possibilities fortunately there was the genes you know thank goodness for them we got the writing genes yeah, and, thank and, goodness. and everything you... <gasps> <I'm>... <laughs> the, the other sisters okay so there's you there's Nora tell mm -hmm. me about the others well, Hallie writes mysteries, Hallie Efren, and Amy Efren writes, she writes period novels, and she just wrote a collection of essays called Loose Diamonds. And do all of you talk about writing? Uh, yes. I especially talk about writing with Nora. I mean, because we, we've collaborated, Collaborate so, so it, it's a real subject. And, and writers just, you have friends who are writers, so you just basically bore each other with <laughs> conversations about structure and drama and... And I'm married to a writer, and uh, he has to listen to all my plot problems and my character problems. And, yeah, that's what it is. Were your parents, would they have been disappointed if you had not been a writer? Yes, I think. Well, I didn't become a writer. First, I, I married the wrong man. And, uh, because <laughs> I've of heard course, that line before. <laughs> no, I, I really did. And because, uh, of course, I was supposed to be a writer. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your 20s. They're just a wash your 20s. And so I just <laughs> went and got married and moved to Rhode Island, where I was just an assistant in an office with a really mean boss. Wow. And eventually the boss was mean to me because mean people are always eventually mean to everyone, right? And so one day I quit. And actually, when I walked out the door, he yelled, you're flat chested. I swear. I swear. Hello. I, I know. He was really mean, right? I so guess. anyway, I was in my twenties, so I thought, what do I do now? So 
did I write? No. I, I started crocheting, and I crocheted purses for department stores. And then one day I was at a cocktail party in New York, and I said to someone, would you like a book about crocheting? He, he was an editor at Simon & Schuster. I said, I know you wouldn't be interested. I mean, I presented it in the most negative way. And he said, yes. I, I have no idea to this day why he said yes, but um, I became a writer. And my husband at the time uh, didn't want me to be a writer. And he said, I, I don't want you to write. And I said, but, but I, I want to, you know, I want to try. You know, when you just want something, but you don't know if you can do it, you know, it's so scary. And, and he said, well, suppose you become famous. And I said, I promise you I won't be famous. <laughs> but instead I left. <laughs> that yes. husband was never meant to be. No, not for Just me. like that job. <laughs> and, and I think you need to stay out of Rhode Island for the rest of your I life. I guess so. Whatever happened I to that guy? Did you just I, want to you, go back I'm and punch him? I was going to name him on television, but I don't know what happened to him. It's so, well, who cares? You know, <laughs> who cares? It was really, I mean, it's a great story. It is a great if story. If you're a writer, all the worst things that happen to you become your story. That's kind of like being a comedian. You, you got to figure all these things when it's something goes close. bad or whatever. Yeah. yeah. You, you really have, you know, your life. So you got to document that. So you, yeah. So in time, some way it's thrilling almost within hours. <laughs> I mean, then it wasn't because I wasn't a writer yet. I had to wait a few years on that one. Tell me about this and how an anxiety attack and a dream contributed to the making of this story. Yes, I, I had a horrible anxiety attack about something that had happened that I knew was going to drag on for several months. And I kept thinking, how am I going to cope with this? I, I don't like to nibble pills or anything. So uh, I just thought, what am I going to do? And I, that night, I had this really powerful dream. It was about uh, a bar. Um, and it was this big bar in North Carolina, a state I'd never been in. There were two women, Lana and Tracy. They were 26. I knew their names. I knew their ages. I knew they were on the run. There was a lion, and there was a third woman who was older. And I knew she was very timid, and that she was on the run, too, and that the lion would change their lives. And I woke up almost, I don't have ever had a dream like this, where you're just, uh, is, did it happen? I can never I remember my dreams. I can um, remember parts of them. Well, this one was just, uh, it was a, it was a, an imperative. <laughs> I, I literally got up and started writing. Right. I, and the story was so much fun for me to write. I had the best time writing it that I lived in that place all the time through that whole anxiety time. And of course, it took me. I thought it would be done in a week practically because I was writing so fast. But uh, two years later long after that particular anxiety was done. But I, I think I gave myself a gift. I just said, I need a place to be. And the lion in my story... Marcel. Told, Marcel, yes, let's yeah. have his wonderful name. Right. I That's love his name. That's a great name for a lion. It is. He's a, it's a, it has comedy yeah. and tragedy in it. I love that name so much. Uh, anyway, Marcel uh, functions in the story for these three women. Uh, he's not just lion, but he's you know, friend and shrink and confessor and, and even higher power for Lana who has a, who has a, uh, addiction problem. And, uh, I think I needed something to calm me down. I think I even created Marcel in a way to sort of make my life calmer because he's kind of, you know, powerful. He's sort very of the, powerful. The Yoda in a way of this. I guess he thing. is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was, I was really once I wrote this book, I was I was terrified to send it to a lion expert because <laughs> uh, there's especially there's a moment in it in the beginning when Rita, who has the love story with the lion, uh, wants to make his you know bond with him, and she buys some shampoo at the pick and save and that smells like dandelions, and she washes her hair with it, and she sits in front of the cage, and the lion sniffs her. And he just loves to sniff her. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get nailed on this by this lion expert. So I sent it off to, this, to a wonderful woman at the San Diego Wild Animal Park named Katie Buss, who worked with lions for years. And she said that was spot on because lions in captivity are scent deprived, you know, S-C-E-N-T. And they spray air fresheners around them to make them happier so that she would do this 
thing that I thought was so whimsical and, and odd, you know, it was just, she said, absolutely, and that the line would love it was, was the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I It's all found meant to be. It was very much because also I went down to North Carolina at some point during the, um, during the uh, writing of this, and I had already written two drafts. And I, there's, this, there's a moment in the book where Rita wants the line to have a tree, and she passes a field, and there's this tree with uh, that looks like it's been struck by lightning. It has no leaves anymore. It's just a, a mighty trunk and limbs. And uh, she convinces these men to dig it up and take it back to the place where Marcel is. So I would get up in the morning. I was in Northampton County, and I would just put random destinations into the GPS and write, take back roads. And I'm driving along, and I pass a field, and there is the tree. Oh, wow. And I screamed. I absolutely <laughs> screamed. And I stopped the car, and someone came along and to see if I was all right, because it's very friendly in North Carolina. And I said, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just, uh, what about this tree? And he said, oh, that's my friend's tree. And in the book I had written that Marcel didn't really, he never had a tree before. He didn't quite know what to do with it so he just rubbed himself against it and he said you know the barks rubbed off because the goats come over and rub themselves against the mm -hmm. tree so I was just you know, you know um, what is that this book and then also the sisterhood of the traveling pants yes uh, Marcel there's Marcel who's kind of the mm -hmm. again the Yoda but it's sort of the um, there's this one character that that or item that uh, all of the uh, other characters seem to gather around, you know, and, and the other story was the pants because they would mail that on to each other that's and all that. That's true. That, are, are you always Well, you that's write? not, I mean, that's based on a book yeah. uh, by Amber Scher. So, um, but Michael, this movie Nora and I wrote, right. has, you know, John an Travolta angel and, look, I think there's magic in the world. I just do, and I think what happened to me in North Carolina is, is evidence of that. And I have a dog. And if you have an animal, you understand how they open your hearts and minds. Your dog too. has about six names. Isn't yes, it? Honey, Pansy, Cornflower, <laughs> Bernice, Mambo, Cass is her name. She's well, a you can make up fluffy your mind white one dog. Name. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, when I grew up, I used to always, you know, go out to dinner with my parents, and you'd you'd get to pick what you wanted to drink, and you'd have to make it last the whole meal. And then I I grew up and realized that if I ran out of Coca Cola, I could order another one as mm -hmm. long as I could afford to pay for it. So I feel the same way about dogs' names. Just because everyone has one doesn't mean my dog can't have, <laughs> can't have six. And my first dog had 13, so, you know, this is an improvement. When you talk about magic, uh, and uh, is that something that you're always kind of looking for whenever you're either writing a book or working on a screenplay or some type of little twist? Uh, I think for me writing, particularly a novel, uh, Stephen King says that, he likes to put characters in a very difficult situation and make them work their way out of it. And that, for me, is what I do in a novel. That's the most important thing. And um, so I know where they're coming from, and I have an idea where they're going. And in this case, I certainly knew Marcel was going to be a major influence in all their lives. And I knew they'd all committed crimes of some sort or another. So once I figured the trouble they were in, I sort of that's the approach I take. And things happen that, you know, when I write, in a way it is kind of magic. Like there's a moment when La Lana in the book slips a condom in her pocket that she finds. <laughs> and I, I knew when I wrote that it was going to play out. I didn't know how or in what way, and it does in a very unexpected way in the book. Uh, but so things happen when you write that could be considered magic in that your imagination is taking you somewhere and you have to just trust that, that you're you're almost blind on the journey and that it that you will end in a safe place tell me about writing is it hard for you or is it something that just flows easily I love it I really love it 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 makes me happy it it puts me in a place where other things go away which is is a great thing to have in your life and almost all your stories and in this particular book, The Lion is In, there's, there are themes of my life all through it, but they're, but they're done in different ways. You know, my parents had drinking problems, mm -hmm. and Lana has one, too. So I, I grew up with that, and, and love is something Tracy wants. And I 
I never thought I was really going to find love, and I did. And I think it's, I think it's such an important thing in life. Especially and, after that guy in Rhode Island. Well, you know? Rita leaves a soul-crushing marriage, you okay, know, yeah. and and that influenced tremendously my understanding of that character mm. and how defeating it can be when someone is just pounding you like a nail into the floor. Not actually, but just emotionally or psychologically or imagine has no imagination and, and you feel you can't you can't fly in any way. So uh, all the themes of your life end up in your stories and they tell you who you are as a person. They tell you like one of the things about this story is that I really I think we all have the imagination to change our lives. And there has been a points in my life and I think there are in all women and men's lives where you need to you need to dig down and make those changes right. and that's really thematically what this book is. It's always hard getting to that place. It, it's to do really it. hard, and in some cases, you feel like you have to burn the bridge you're standing on, and mm -hmm. that's very scary. So, <clears throat> all these women and sisterhood is important to me because my sisters have all and my girlfriends have always gotten me through. So, I think the themes of your life end up in your books. You talked about your parents, and, and I, I talked about your parents with Nora, and you mentioned the alcoholism and all of that. Um, how did that affect you? Well, I'm, I'm the second born, and see, I don't think anybody has the same parents, because you're born into the family at a different time, and how your parents relate to you is different than they relate to the other kids. You know, some Sometimes you really get along with your mother and your sister or brother doesn't get along with your mother or, or you think that the person who's the problem with your parents is one parent and the other sibling thinks it's, you know what I mean. It's, yeah. So I don't think we had the same parents, but my parents didn't really start drinking until I was 11 and Nora was almost out of the house. So I know, I, I mean, when I say this, this book happened because of an anxiety attack, I come by my anxieties honestly because I lived in an anxious place. You're always anxious as a child if you have parents who aren't in control. And so, and you find ways to cope. And that, a great way is that you give yourself a book to write. But I, I know that I have much higher anxiety, for instance, than she does. I think that's just definitely true. Do the other sisters have? Well, I mean, I don't like to speak for them. You know, yeah. I think they have their own particular ways of, of coping. I was very close to my father, and I took his side, and my sister Hallie just left the house. You know, we, we make different choices, right. and all that af affects who we are. And I think you're right about it's sort of the time and place, you know, how you're affected by Huge. various things, and you have different relationships, and how they can change, and mm -hmm. how that affects you. Yeah, it's interesting how that kind of all plays out. Let's talk about, you know, there, there's writing the books. Um, well, actually, writing the books for an adult audience or adult yes. reader versus young adults. Mm -hmm. Do you? I also write kids' books sometimes. Yeah. Which one do you like best? Or uh, well, I like. I think now I'm liking writing adult books, but that's because that's what I'm doing right now. I, I like that I have the ability to work um, in different areas. Just the way a movie, which can be so painful because you're not, you don't own your material as a, mm. as a writer. The, the studios and the producers they can just fire you. So I write books because no one can touch them. They're my voice, it's where I am at the time. But a movie has a kind of excitement yeah. that is undeniable. And when it comes to life, when it really does happen, it's, it's tremendously and interesting. And the successes that you've had. Yeah, too. that's been, yes. And I've been so blessed with Nora because, she, you know, I can't get fired if she's, unless, you know, because she's on the movie, I'm protected. And that's a rare situation to be in. And we have so much fun. So that's, that's Do, really good. When, uh, when you work with her, now she directs as well, doesn't she? She directs the movies right. that way, yes, yeah. which but is perfect for the older sister. <laughs> yes. And dealing with She's like, yeah, sister. absolutely, because then she's, you know, if she, excuse me, if she bosses you around, you know, she has the right to, and she's not just because she's your older sister. She can get away with it. <laughs> Absolutely. But how about in the screenwriting? I mean, does she? Do you guys usually well, work together know, th on that? Yeah, we do. We co we co we write together, and really, in fact, the director has to have. I mean, if I say I want to put this in a bowling alley, and she says I don't want to shoot a scene in the bowling alley, then there's no bowling alley. There's no question about it. But uh, so I think that 
collaboration is the nature of the movie business. You're always trying to adjust for one person or another person, and that's not the way it is in a book. So it's it's that's a big difference. Okay, so we have the books, you have the movies, mm -hmm. and then there are the plays. Yeah, that was a surprise. I gotta say that was, uh, and what you're talking about is Love Loss right. and What I Wore, which is based on a book by Eileen Beckerman. And the idea of it is really that it turns out if you ask women about their clothes, they tell you about their lives. And so it's women telling stories about and, and their lives. And this is a, a kind of a rotating cast that has been presenting this. Uh, yes, we, we were two years in New York um, uh, off-Broadway. And in the meantime, we have sold the rights to, uh, my goodness, it's been in Manila, it's been in... Uh, Mexico City, it's been in Paris and Tel Aviv and Johannesburg and Sydney in the Opera House. Wow. And, I mean, it's had an amazing life, but I say this is really important. This thing was dead as a doornail for at least five years really? in a drawer, okay? And we never, ever expected it to happen. We had done workshops, they never worked, and then the director, Karen Carpenter, uh, as someone had given it to her, and she wanted to do a workshop, and we fine, you know, whatever. We never thought it was going to work. And we got some really good casting, and suddenly, you know, casting the right actor in the right part can make such a difference in something, and uh, suddenly it was working, and the next thing we knew it was on, and the next thing we knew it was a success. And I say this to all writers out there, or anyone who thinks that they ha ought to give up, you know, you never know. You yeah. have to be so persistent. And the timing as well. Yeah, I mean, the timing was good, but, you know, it probably wasn't bad five years ago either. It's just that it's just you have to believe in the work because lots of times no one else does. And then it's the right people that come together to make it all work. Yeah, that's I saw true. a Sunday morning piece in which you and Nora were in, and they also had clips from uh, this and... Uh, the actresses that you got to, to be a part of this, the way they would make it come alive, it was just really Yeah, we had 120 in the end. We wow. just closed last month. We had 120, and so many came to the closing party. And because it's all women's stories, it was a real sisterhood. And every cast, which we rotated every month, every cast just bonded and had so much fun. And I was just, a, it was an amazing experience. And theater... You know, in the movies, there's there's so much equipment and there's so many people to please. But in the theater, you're just, especially, you know, it's just the actors, the director, and us. And hey, our wonderful producer, and, Bill. And, yeah, and this is very basic because it, mm. they're basically sitting on stools and yes, they yes. have, uh, you know, a little easel or whatever in front of them. And they're reading, the, the script is in front of them, but they're... Um, they're it's storytelling. Right. It That's story what it is. Yeah. And one of the reasons it works is that everyone in the audience has their own stories about their own clothes and when they're hearing these stories the women on stage are telling stories if you're in the audience you're thinking about what you wore when you went to your prom or got married or you know fell in love or or somebody you know, broke up any, with you no, someone or, broke up with yeah. you what whatever or you get fired from a job and yes, somebody tells you something exa nasty exactly you know, like yeah, actually that my yeah he's in there because he uh, is the guy that told you you had. Yeah, I have a story in there called Thin because I was really thin then, and yeah, and uh, when I it's this incident from then when he was telling me I had to, he didn't want me to write. I I had written the beginning of my crochet book and I recited it to myself. There's no wrong way to crochet, <laughs> and I kept saying that to myself just to block him out. And we used that in the play. Hey, go back to the crochet book when you yeah. asked about that. What kind of a was it a funny ha ha kind of thing about crochet? No, no, it was, it was a serious? A serious, really. Yeah, how it to? was like a how to crochet. Really? I knew how to crochet, and yeah, and that was it was a very earthy time in this world. Everybody was making things, you know. So it was very. It was actually a pretty successful book. Really, it's called the Adventurous Crocheter. Yeah. <laughs> That's like a PBS thing. You I know, know, I know. It does. I, I, I it's so that. crazy. That's where I you started. You could be on Create, the, the PBS but, Create channel. But my first really big success was How to Eat Like a Child. Oh, and yeah. it's, it's instructions about, ch from the child's point of view, like eat peas, mash, and flatten into thin sheet on plate, like that, right? <laughs> and I realized, oh, it started with the crochet book. I was writing instructions there. I got really good at it, and then I applied it. You just it. applied and then, it? Right. I just switched it over, but comedy, and, and, yeah. Yeah, throwing with all With comedy. Of that. So, um, okay, Lion is in. What's in the works? Well, I have a movie that I 
think is going to get made in, in September, which is about a pet psychic. Um, and, uh, well, it's about a woman who talks to animals, falls in love with a man who talks to the dead. Okay? <laughs> Only she can do it, and he can't really do it. Mm. So she thinks he can do it because she can, and he thinks she's a fraud because he's a fraud. And he has a dog. And that's all I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Might Nora be a part of that one, too? No, she, no, no. This is an original, actually, oh, I wrote. Okay. And I think we now have a director and a star. And we, uh, just Movies are like these things. They may happen. They may yeah. not happen until they're actually shooting. Oh, my goodness. You're on the set, Don't sitting dress. in the yes. chair, watching how yeah, uh -huh, all this come yes. apart. The book is called uh, The Lion is In, Delia Efron. Thank you so much for stopping by, and uh, it's a great joy talking to you. And I feel so honored that I've managed to talk to two of yeah, the Yeah, you got four. two more to go. Yeah, I know. So tell them <laughs> when they come to Seattle, they have to stop by and talk to me. I think they'd love to. All right. All Delia right. Efron, thank you thank very much. You. All right. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you.